Well, you all have remembrances of Hudson's, I'm sure. How many, let's get a, a show of hands, how many of you worked at any of the stores? Quite a few of you. Mostly downtown or some of the suburban stores? Downtown. We actually have a special guest here today. And I wanted to present um, Regina Barrero, who is 102 years old. Yay. And you know, that was one of the things that uh, a lot of people disliked in the early days of retailing was you had wooden floors like this. And you're on your feet for a long time. Your feet are ready to fall off at the end of a shift. Now, if you work downtown, some of you might remember, you could take the elevator up to 14 and go back there to the hospital. And there were actually three different areas where you could go in for privacy and you could soak your feet in a foot tub. We actually saved one of those from the building at the Historical Museum. But the company was founded back in 1880 at the original Detroit Opera House, which was on campus marshes, uh, where CompuWare is today. Hudson's originally started out as a men's and boys haberdashery store. Now, they were only in the Opera House for about 10 years or so. They actually took over a spot that another department store had. Some of you might remember Newcomb Endicott and Company, which was actually Michigan's first department store. They were also founded in the old Opera House, but later on moved farther up Woodward to Grand River. So Hudson's was in the Opera House until 1890, and then in 1891, they opened up a large, almost a block long building at Farmer and Gratiot called the Big Red Store. Eight floors, red brick, arched windows, one of the biggest buildings in town at the time. And of course, a lot of business people thought that Mr. Hudson was a little crazy to be moving that far north, that customers may not follow him because retail at that time was pretty much centered around Woodward and Jefferson Avenue, where there was a lot of retail. So the goal, though, was always to get some frontage on Woodward Avenue. But that particular block that we know today where the store was, was occupied by a church, Himmelhoes, and several other retailers, including Newcomb's. So by 1910, they started buying some of these small parcels. 1911, bought a few more parcels. Then by the late teens, they had amassed enough space on Woodward Avenue that plans went into motion to be able to demolished the 1891 building so that they could put up an even grander building. 1923, a 16-story building at Gratiot and Farmer took the place of the 1891 building. Now, while that was going on, they moved everything over into those different parcels that they had acquired on Woodward. Then, in 1927, they bought out their competition. They bought out New Commendicate and Company, which by that time had a large 12-story building and then a four-story building from Woodward on through to Farmer Street. They demolished all of that. That was sort of like an L-shaped footprint of a building and that's where the 25-story edifice went up. So 1928, when that building opened, 
you had a little over 2 million square feet of space devoted to retail, 49 acres. Tallest department store ever built anywhere with goods and services for customers on 17 floors. Now, altogether, there were 32 levels in the building. If you count the floors, the mezzanines, and the half floors. Some of you might remember some of those half floors, like 15 and a half, where they used to put gift baskets together, 21 and a half, where the sign shop used to be. So lots of lot, non-selling things going on in that building besides just selling. They were also one of the first department store groups to have European buying offices as well as offices on Broadway in New York and um, just outside the garment district. Now, Mr. Hudson himself was very devoted to the community. He's credited with being one of the founders of the United Way. He helped get the land donated at Woodward and Eight Mile for the state fairgrounds. He was on the police commission. He was on the school board. He was also on the board of Harper Hospital. Now, Mr. Hudson died in 1912, unfortunately. He was originally from England, and he was on a trip back to England to visit relatives. He was succeeded in the business by his nephews, the Weber brothers, the four Weber brothers. They really propelled the company into what it became. Now, they also continued his community involvement by establishing the Hudson Weber Foundation, which still exists to this day. Somebody was asking me earlier about um, Joseph L. Hudson Jr. He is still on that board. He's a trustee of the Hudson Weber Foundation, which have their offices downtown Detroit on 4th Street. They still provide grants to arts and cultural organizations, women's organizations, children's organizations. Hudson's also was one of the first retailers in the country to contribute 5% of all pre-tax profits to go back into the communities where they have stores. So throughout Michigan, a lot of our communities would be that much poorer today without the grants that libraries, museums, and arts organizations received. The company was very big on arts, culture, children, and women's organizations for these grants through the years. Target picked up on that, and today, if you, if you have a Target charge card, you know that you can, some of your money can be earmarked to specific schools, and also 5%, if you use your Target red card, 5% of what is charged can go back into various communities uh, and nonprofits throughout the country. So, very important through the years. Um, I brought a number of things. If you didn't have a chance to look at some of these items up here, um, for many years, of course, there were a lot of items that they had their own name on. Like this has got the original logo from the 20s and 30s on it. This is a box of soap flakes. I mean, not too many people probably remember too that they even had their own cigars. Or, Hudso was a brand in the budget store for items. This happens to be a box of tissue. But Hudso was one of their own brands that they used in the budget store. Now, the budget store, which through the years was also called the basement store, and later on the rainbow store, actually saved the company several times. Saved the company during the Depression and also saved the company during the war years. The basement store was also Hudson's biggest competition. I mean, we had, we had Kearns, we had Crowley's, we had Federal's, we had branches of Sears and J.C. Penney all over the, the metro area, but nobody came that close in terms of dollar amounts. The budget store was their single biggest competitor because Hudson's had such a huge command of the market. Now, if you worked in the downtown store, you remember the budget store actually took up two entire floors. The first basement for fashion and shoes, the second basement for home goods. Total square footage of those two floors was around 200,000 square feet. So that budget store alone was the size of a Meyer, Target, or a Walmart today within the confines of that building. So the store, as you know, appealed to virtually everybody. 
If you couldn't afford to shop upstairs, you could shop downstairs. If you weren't, didn't have the means to eat off white linen on the 13th floor dining rooms, you had your choice downstairs. You had a large cafeteria in the second basement. You had a snack bar and an orangeade counter in the first basement. You had another restaurant on the mezzanine. You had a large um, ice cream counter also on the mezzanine. Another snack bar on the fourth floor. All very affordable as opposed to dining on 13, which of course is where the, the nicer dining rooms were. Um, and I notice you have a great collection in the back here of menus that the Troy Historical Museum has from the early American room the, and the Georgian room, which were two of the dining rooms. And then you also have one from the Pine Room, which was the southernmost dining room on the 13th floor. Now, in 1959, the Georgian room and the early American room were combined to become the Riverview Room with large windows you could look out onto the river. Pine Room stayed on right up until the time the store closed. Later on, they, they renamed that the Beef Emporium for businessmen's lunches and things like that. But meals, very important to the store. Up to 15,000 people a day would be dining in that downtown building in all these various restaurants. And for those who worked in the downtown building, you probably also remember the enormous employee cafeteria up on the 14th floor. So now a lot of those menu items still exist today. And of course, even though it's Macy's today, some of the Macy branches still have some of those items on the menu. Lakeside, Oakland, uh, Southland, Westland, and 12 Oaks still have restaurants that serve Maurice salad, popovers, Canadian cheese soup, Mandarin chicken salad, things like that off of the menu. So also there's some um, pewterware here from the 13th floor dining rooms too. And if you look at all of this, no matter what type of piece it is, if it's a goblet, a plate, a silverware, the name was always imprinted on this, either Hudson's or the JL Hudson Company. This is kind of fun too. This is a music roll from, some of you might remember the carillon up on the 20th floor that played music. In, inside the store as well as outside the store during certain times of the year. Easter, other promotions. This happens to be from Christmas. And some of these selections were Deck the Halls, Tidings of Joy, Jingle Bells, Let It Snow, and Silver Bells. Elevators. I've got an actual skirt here from one of the elevator hostesses. You know, the elevator hostesses had their own manual too. It was called Elevator phraseology of how they were to speak to patrons, how they were to speak to, you know, sales associates. Thanks, Ann. And, you know, they also had to know where all the non-selling areas were in the store as well. Now, this was Otis Elevator Company's single biggest installation of any building in this country. 51 passenger elevators and 17 freight elevators. And some of you might remember on Farmer Street, the biggest freight elevator of all, you could actually back a semi into, and then that trailer could stay on that elevator and go to the various floors. So, now I was lucky enough to meet um, Naaman Clark, who ran the elevator department for a number of years. He started with the company in 1943 and stayed on until the mid-1970s. He started as a starter meaning he was the first one there in the morning, make sure the, the cars were clean, make sure everything was running operationally well before he turned it over to the hostesses. Also responsible for the escalators and also responsible for the alley. Uh, a lot of you might remember the alley between the Woodward Building and the Farmer Street Building. So, and he had 125 mostly females under his hat that reported to him. So he was also one of the first African Americans in management at the company. Later on, when he retired, he was head of the credit union. Let's see what else we got up here. We've got a uniform from the warehouse. A lot of people kind of forget about all the warehouses, which worked in tandem with the downtown building. You had about a million and a half square feet of warehousing space 
on Brush and Bobian. Some of those buildings were incorporated into what we know today as, as Ford Field. Now, 36th District Court, Madison Center, also was a former Hudson warehouse. There was also a back office area, a building about 10 floors in Harmony Park. There was also a warehouse on Fort Street where the floats were made year round for the Santa Parade. There was also a warehouse on St. Antoine. And then there was also a large warehouse on West Warren, which Hudson's bought from People's Outfitting. And that later on, that's where all of the soft goods were received and marked. The downtown warehouses pretty much became hard goods, you know, housewares, furniture, things like that. And of course, we all remember the warehouse sales, going down there very early in the morning, lining up. Of course, if you worked there, you'd be there for several days that week, marking things and making sure everything was in its proper place. The warehouse sales were a lot of fun. I mean, you never knew what was gonna be there. It was everything from crazy fur coats to puzzles to plants. A uh, lot of home goods though too. And of course, everybody loved jumping on those giant freight elevators and being taken floor to floor. And then the smell of hot dogs and popcorn wafting through the air in those old warehouse buildings. So the warehouse sales later on moved to Northland. And then when the company became Marshall Field, Marshall Field built a new warehouse at 696 in DeQuinder, which they tried doing warehouse sales there, but it really didn't work nearly as well. And unfortunately, that, brand new, that was a brand new facility in uh, 2000. Um, when the company became Macy's, they decided to close that facility. So, so warehouses, lots of square footage around town as well. Um, the auditorium was also another real important part of the store. That auditorium on the 12th floor really acted like a civic center. This is long before we had a Cobo Hall or, you know, a rock financial showplace. Um, the, the auditorium on 12 is where you would go for fashion shows, flower shows, car shows, dog shows, cat shows, you name it, all sorts of things. Colleen Moore's Dollhouse used to travel to a big uh, show that they did in the auditorium every year. There's actually a booklet up here on that. That Dollhouse still exists, too. It's at the uh, Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. Um, another big show that they did, Hudson's commissioned um, a dozen artists around the country for a program called Michigan on Canvas. And these artists depicted Michigan in all different types of paintings that traveled to just about every library and museum around the state. And then ended, the show ended at the state fairgrounds and then came back downtown for one final showing in the auditorium. Later on, all of those paintings were donated to the Henry Ford Museum. This is a glove tree from the downtown store, this is from the accessories department. Of course, this is how we used to display gloves. You've got a little brass hand on here, and gloves would be hung on here. And then you would also be given a little instructional booklet on the proper way to wear gloves and where to wear gloves. Of course, years ago, you used to wear gloves for just about everything every time you left the house. So this is a... Um, a ledger, this is one of the, a really great find. Uh, this is from the 1920s, and this was a gentleman who was in charge of various floors of the downtown store. And it's basically a diary at Christmas time of everything that went on in that building. It's fascinating to read. Um, fabrics. I've got some fabric, actually, booklets up here. I actually just recently acquired. Um, Fabrics were also a very important part of the store because not that long ago, people actually used to sew. But look at, look at that department. I mean, it looks like a casbah. There is so much fabric. I'll pass that around. And of course, there were always traveling shows from McCall's and some of the other companies that created fabrics. This one is a little sexist uh, for men only shop, <laughs> which the store had for a number of years. This was uh, traditionally during the holidays. And the only time women were allowed in here was like 11 to two during lunch hour, basically secretaries buying for their significant other. 
Toyland. A lot of people remember Toyland. And of course, Toyland was on 12, even though the children's floor, floor traditionally had always been on the fourth floor. Um, and if you remember, on that floor also, the brass drinking fountains were always a little smaller than they were on the other floors. Um, these, I'll pass these images around too. This is uh, of Toyland, some Lego windows on Woodward. But of course, before we got into specialized retail, you know, of course, Hudson's was the place to go. They had the biggest toy land. They had the biggest sporting goods store. You know, today, everything is specialized. We go to Toys R Us for toys. Um, you know, we go um, for appliances and things like that. We go to a Best Buy. Well, Hudson's used to have the biggest appliance department and used to put on refrigerator shows and TV shows and radio shows. Um, so things have really changed dramatically through the years. Bridal. Got a couple little bridal books here, too. Hudson's was one of the first stores in the country to have a bridal registry and a gift registry. Also the first store to have a computerized <coughs> bridal registry. And speaking of Santa, they, everybody knew, of course, the store had the real Santa on the 12th floor. And that was the real Santa that appeared on the marquee to give the key to the mayor at the end of the parade. But, of course, children didn't really realize that when you went to Santa, there may be half a dozen other Santas in various different rooms beyond those blue walls. Um, the store was one of the first stores in the country to offer you a choice of Santas. You could have a Caucasian Santa, you could have a Hispanic Santa, or you could have an African-American Santa. And, of course, you were greeted by... Christmas Carol. Christmas Carol and the Pixies. Was anybody a Pixie here? You were? Yes. I, st I, start I started off in 1959 working as a Santa helper. And when the kids would come through the line, you would take the African kids and they would go into a certain line because there would be a black Santa in there. But I don't remember the Asian ones or anything like that. And then, of course, the other kids would go to the other ones. Yes, that's, and I stayed five years. And the best thing I ever got at Hudson's, I have to tell you, after 45 years of marriage is my bride right here. All right. <laughs> And you know, that's something that we don't have today. I mean, you had generations of families that worked at companies like this for many, many years. And of course today, the way the business is, people don't stay and it's this constant turnover. I say so. this with respect. It was a great place for guys and gals to meet. Any number of our friends that we still have met the same way back here. Oh, thank you for sharing. Um, and let's throw in that first little video. This is only about four minutes long, but it'll bring back some memories for you. And this is when Marshall Fields joined the group. So it was Dayton's, Hudson's, and Marshall Fields. So this would have been 1990 or so. Faces have changed, and the buildings, hemlines have gone up and down. Retail, after all, is a business built on change. But from the very beginning, from the first time the name of J.L. Hudson went up on the old Detroit Opera House in 1881, the heart of our tradition has remained the same. Sir, our guests. Our tradition of guest service is how we built our reputation and warm relationships with generations of guests. At Hudson's, service is an attitude, a thread that runs through everything we do. 
It shapes the way we treat each other and our guests. It affects the look of our stores and the merchandise we carry. Hudson's tradition of guest service began with what was, at the time, a radical idea, clearly marking the prices on all the goods. Other merchants used a code that guests couldn't read. And rather than keep merchandise put away in boxes, we had it on display in attractive glass front fixtures where guests could see it more easily. Hudson's also offered guests these credit coins, forerunners of the charge cards we use today, so they can make their purchases without having to carry large amounts of cash. We offered delivery service, so our guests wouldn't have to cart around armloads of boxes. And our basement store offered 20 departments of value-priced merchandise, soon becoming the largest store within a store in the country. We offered the fashions guests came to expect from Hudson's. We serve our guests in the way we do business and through our involvement in the community. We are connected to our guests. Their concerns are our concerns. When times are hard, we pitch in. When they're good, we celebrate together. Marshall Fields, each with a special place in the heart of the community. We are a family of stores dedicated to fashion leadership and guest service in everything we do, in merchandising, in marketing. special events we sponsor. The people of Dayton's, Hudson's, and Marshall Fields offer our guests our very best. Our common traditions are still alive today. Our department stores continue to grow and evolve, providing new opportunities for our people and new ways to serve our guests. There will be new faces and new buildings, but it all comes from the heart of Hudson's, our proud tradition of guest service. on television star. So many book signings too. Of course the store had the biggest book department of any store in town long before we had Barnes and Noble or Borders or anything like that. Um, you saw the American flag in the video too. The last time the American flag flew on the Woodward frontage was 1976 for the bicentennial. And Woodward Avenue was closed off and the Detroit Symphony played right in the middle of the street. Uh, the flag was donated to the Smithsonian. However, it was simply too big to display. So it basically sat in storage. It was then sold to a flag conservator out west. As the years went on, though, of course, the flag started to deteriorate. And by the 90s, uh, uh, Target gave them permission to destroy the flag. So the, that flag no longer exists. However, in 2001, Target commissioned a brand new flag for the State Street, what was then Marshall Field store. So that flag still flies today on special days like Flag Day, Memorial Day, Fourth of July. And if you're ever in that State Street store, it's in the north end. And it's from basically about the 12th floor all the way down. It touches the top of the cosmetic showcases. So. 
So in some respects, the flag still exists. Where is State Street in Chicago. Oh, Chicago. Chicago. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the company, of course, you know, it gets a little confusing through the years, but in 1969, Dayton's in Minneapolis and Hudson's Detroit merged to become the Dayton Hudson Department Store Company. Now, the Webbers had been friends with the Dayton family for many, many years. Dayton's in Minneapolis is very similar to Hudson's. Big command of the market, big successful downtown store, very involved in the community. So it was a logical move for the two to join. Separate staffs, still kept separate names. Then in 1984, they decided to combine the two companies. And the headquarters started to move to Minneapolis. Some folks stayed here in Detroit. Um, of course, the downtown store had closed in 1983. But you still had a corporate staff of about 1,200 people working in that building, spread out throughout all those floors. 1986, the last of the departments merged and moved to Minneapolis. And about 50 people then moved to the top floor at Northland. Northland offices there became Region 1 headquarters, which was the Michigan stores, the Ohio stores, the Indiana stores. Then in 1990, the company bought Marshall Fields in Chicago. So it was Dayton's, Hudson's, Marshall Fields. Still called Dayton Hudson Department Star Company. Then in 2000, that name was dropped in favor of Target Incorporated because all of the profits were coming from Target, the discount division. Target was actually begun by Dayton's in 1960. And of course, you've got to please the stockholders. And that's where all the profits were coming from. Now Target continued to pour a lot of money into the department store division. 2001, the stockholders said, we're still not satisfied with the return on investment. You've got to save some more money. So they decided to kill the Dayton name, kill the Hudson name, and go with what they felt was the strongest branding name, and that was Marshall Fields. So in 2001, all of the Dayton's and Hudson stores became Marshall Fields. Target is still pouring lots of money into the division, but as you know, people are shopping online, they're shopping discount stores, they're going to Kohl's and everywhere else. Sales are not what they should be, so and yet another economic move, Target puts the department store division up for sale. They sell it in 2004 to May Company out of St. Louis. Now May Company operated stores around the country that you're probably familiar with. May Company Cleveland, May Company Los Angeles, Kaufman's Pittsburgh, Filene's Boston. So they all joined the mix. Now May Company kept all of these separate names. That only lasted a year. Now, when Target sold to May Company, they, Target knew that May Company was not a good steward of their own history. They really didn't care about their history. They did not want them to have the archives at all. By this time, Target had amassed a huge, great, all-inclusive archive of Dayton's, Hudson's, Marshall Fields, and Mervyn's. Um, and this took up the entire 11th and 12th floors of the State Street store in Chicago. Before they sold the company, they moved everything to Minneapolis into a brand new temperature controlled warehouse and also put an archive in downtown Minneapolis. And of course they preserve, they have 80 of the brass drinking fountains from the downtown store. They've got the brass nameplates at say the JL Hudson company. So they've done an excellent job of saving ads, photographs, scrapbooks, you name it. Well, May Company only lasted a year. May Company then sold to Federated Department Stores, which was Bloomingdale's and Macy's, and that took place in 2005. Macy's did not want to keep any of these nameplates. They killed all of them all around the country. So Macy's went from becoming what most of us knew is a New York-based department store with a strong presence in California to a national concern with over 800 department stores coast to coast. And that's pretty much what we end up with today. Um, some of our traditions have gone away. Um, 
Of course, the, uh, the fireworks that you saw in the video, the International Freedom Festival fireworks, Hudson's began in 1959. That is still carried on by Target today. Uh, the Thanksgiving Day Parade, which Hudson's began in 1924, back then it was called Santa's Toy Parade. Uh, Hudson's continued to fund that parade up until about 1980 or so. But by then it was becoming cost prohibitive for them alone to spend between one and two million a year on that parade. So they reached out to Detroit Renaissance, several other foundations, Stroh's at the time, Channel 4 at the time, Art Van helped financially to save the parade. And this, this all led up to America's Thanksgiving Parade Foundation being formed. So that the parade still exists today. It's one of the oldest in the country. It started actually the same year as Macy's Big Parade in New York. Uh, one thing that is not with us anymore is Fash Bash, which began back at the old, um, at the Pontchartrain Hotel. And Hudson sponsored that for many, many years as a benefit for the Art Institute. Um, Fash Bash is actually a registered trademark to the Art Institute. They are the only ones that can use it. Now Macy's has continued that tradition although today it's called Glamorama, and it's produced in Chicago, Minneapolis, Los Angeles, and San Francisco, but no longer in the Detroit market. So, um, and we've got one other one that we're going to show. You might know a couple of people that are interviewed in here. This was a, one of many videos that we did in the late 90s when the store, when it was announced that the store was going to come down, and then I did a, an exhibit at the museum. being with us. As you know, each week at this time, we present a different kind of story about our town. Today, well, a story about a very old tradition, a tradition at Christmas, a tradition about an old building that once housed a very famous department store, a story about Hudson's, a story from the heart. black or white famous or not, or not, it's just something about that building seemed to just take in all people. I didn't know nothing about segregation or nothing like that, it's just, you just felt good when you saw Hudson, you just felt good, it was a magic feeling. Just walking by, it, it, I didn't be time I walked by, I didn't go in, and just felt drawn to it, like it had a soul or something, saying, come to me, come to me. In its heyday, this building employed over 10,000 people. And also, in the, you figure in the 40s and the 50s, 100,000 people a day shot that store. Well, I can remember as a young kid being in the, this was in the 50s, like one of my aunts, who was from the South, we were poor people from the South, we took the bus down, we didn't have a car to pay, we took the bus down. And as a kid, you could read people move. And she immediately, when we got to Hudson, she changed from being real granny, like I call her, she was that granny. She got sort of like an air of sophistication about it. And I could feel that in her, so I knew Hudson was something special, and that I had to be on my best behavior. My first part time job was in 1958 uh, for Christmas holidays after I graduated. I worked in the second basement store, and it was. Uh, just a treat to work there and watch all the hustle and bustle and uh, if, if you needed to boost your uh, Christmas spirits up, uh, Hudson downtown was a place to go. When you went to the 12th floor of the toy department and you were in line going to Santa Claus, I mean every window you passed was an animated window. One of the big things, of course, was to go down at night and walk around the building and look in the windows, and the windows were just fairy tale. They had the most fantastic collection of dolls from all over the world, and every size and every price. The trains ran all over, not just in one area, they had trains all over the department. 
and every conceivable kind of toy in those days. And then up at the far end, up at the stage, there he was in his red suit, Santa Claus. And of course, the only true Santa Claus uh, appeared at the 12th floor, where he spent the month of December. And I believe that then, I believe it now. <laughs> so hats, making hats and Bible bales, that was my job. I loved it. At Christmas, they were more on different toys and different things, but then they would come down with their children, and then they would pick on the hat, but in a hurry. The children didn't want to wait, you know. Well, my parents were always involved in lessons, my father especially, uh, in doing things, and they even asked him to film the Santa Claus parade. Being the oldest one in the family, I would get the privilege of going with him stand out and freeze on the marquee while we took pictures of the Santa Claus Parade. I worked at the downtown Hudson store and uh, had an opportunity to meet a young lady that worked over there in the ledgers by the name of June. And uh, in 1958, we were married. And June and I would have three children, uh, the first of which was a girl and we named her Joyce Lynn. So she was Joyce Lynn Handley. And uh, not by coincidence, her initials are JLH. The old building passed away 15 Christmases ago, but the mystique, the legend of Hudson's downtown has lingered and grown in our heart. And soon the heart will speak from the pages of a book written by one who knows the legend well. There's a life within the walls of that building. I still believe that it's still alive. And I wanted to to live to help the memories live on for people. Undoubtedly Hudson's has met its demise as far as the building is concerned. But uh, that wrecking ball certainly can't take away the memories, the special memories that I had down there so many years ago. Can't take that away. The words wisdom on the downtown library, I always <laughs> am upset because where was the wisdom in saving that damn building? Yeah. Because you know what? It was meant to stand. It was it was so strong that it took almost two years to bring that building down. Uh, they actually had to slice it down the middle because the plan was for both buildings then to fall in on each other. But as you know, I mean, this is from one of the elevators. This is all brass. And if you remember, you had certain cars and certain banks of elevators that would go to odd-numbered floors, some to even-numbered floors. Like this one went from the third basement, 13579, 13, 16, 19, and then roof. Um, this is just a small little piece some of you may have worked up there from what at one time was the world's largest switchboard on the 20th floor. <laughs> 35,000 calls a day. Now, there was also, these were the type of bricks on the tower. There were actually several layers of sort of a smoked covering over the brick, and the bricks had, they were reinforced and they also were curved because of the high winds on those upper floors. The regular bricks were red, and I know a lady brought one over here today. They were, this was a regular brick, these were all reinforced with yet another brick, an orange brick on the inside. Then, on the freight elevator lobbies on each level had sort of an amber-colored glazed brick. Then, on 13 and 14 in all of the kitchens, you had a white glazed brick. And that's real brick. This, these are real bricks. Okay, and you also had a lot of beautiful tile throughout the building, too. It's not Poabic, but very similar to Poabic. These actually were from the employee cafeteria on 14. Now, you all know what a normal screw or a bolt looks like. Well, have you ever seen a Hudson bolt or screw? <laughs> 
So the building was built to withstand just about everything. Now, the company sold the building in January of 1990. The helicopters came in. They took all the 10-foot-tall Hudson name, which was all copper-clad and neon, from the tower. The brass nameplates came off. Southwestern Associates from Windsor, businessmen's group from Windsor bought the building, wanting to make it mixed-use development. Apartments, stores, parking. But it became very apparent several months in, after they bought the building, that they had, did not have the wherewithal to do anything with the building. The building was being stripped. Elevator parts, escalator parts, copper, brass, nickel, leaving the building. I think the straw that broke the camel's back in terms of the city, and certainly the fire department, was when they illegally dismantled the fire suppression system without any notification, and also cut off the electricity. If you worked in the downtown building, you remember Edison actually had three substations within that building. There was enough energy in that building to light up a city of 25,000. Mm -hmm. So once the, water, the fire suppression system was disconnected, water started to seep into the basement. The entire fourth basement was covered with water and it started to come up to the third basement. Mm -hmm. And then, they? pardon? Southwestern Associates. They did. Yes. Yeah. They were the owners of the building at the time. Now, at some point in time in the 90s, they sold the building to three other interests, none of whom, nobody was paying taxes, nobody was paying for security. In fact, Wyandotte Alarm, which had been doing security initially for the Canadians, they weren't paid. They put a lien on the building. They almost were able to buy the building for $35,000. So the building, according to Crane's Detroit business, actually ended up selling for $750,000 to the Canadians, which here you have a 2 million plus square foot building in the middle of, at the time, the 10th largest city in the country, sold for under a million dollars. So it kind of shows you how depressed the land values were downtown at the time. So. You've got an Oak Park developer who said he owned the building. You've got a Gross Point developer who says he owns the building. You've got a Detroit-based church that says they own the building. Nobody paying taxes, nobody providing security, people breaking in, everything is leaving. So Mayor Archer at the time decided to put an end to this, find out what can we do to get control of that block because it's an eyesore, it's dangerous, there were a number of fires. There were homeless people living as high up as the 10th floor. So he created the downtown partnership and very quietly they ended up buying all of the parcels so that by 1996 they had control of the block and got all of these crazy people out of the building. Unfortunately, the plan was, you know, remember there wasn't a whole lot of money. They felt that if the money that was available went into that building, there'd be no money to develop all of the other buildings along Woodward. Because if you remember, once the store closed, it was like the domino effect up and down Woodward Avenue. Everybody else closed. Whether it was shoe stores, jewelry stores, Kresge's, Woolworths, everybody left. There was nobody left. So and there just wasn't enough money to redevelop all those other properties. So much money would be sucked into the Hudson building. So the powers that be, the city and various business people, felt that the building needed to come down. So a friend of mine was working at the partnership and I said, it's really a crime. We really need to get in there and photograph everything. <laughs> um, and also let's do an exhibit at the museum, which would also then soften the blow to the public once the major announcement was, was out there that it's definitely coming down. So I took the trustees from the historical museum in and of course this was <laughs> Uh, we were able to get the keys to the building Thanksgiving week. There had been a snowstorm, and there was only one door that opened, the loading dock door on Farmer Street, and you could only get it open a few feet. So if you can imagine trustees from the museum crawling on their bellies on, in the snow to get into the building, and we took them up as far as seven, the Woodward shops. And of course, they'd seen enough because it just wasn't what they remembered. So they said, okay, just put it together, make it happen. So for the next year, I would go to the partnership. 
on a Friday, get the key to the building, and then I pulled six volunteers from Wayne State University to help. And for the next year, then we called items from the building for the exhibit to fill a 5,000 square foot gallery. There was still enough left in the building in terms of signage, photos, ads, um, display cases, and things like that, uh, that we were actually able to put together a really cool exhibit. Uh, and then actually photographed the building too, black and white color and slides. And then we donated all uh, several thousand photos to the Historical Museum and also to the National Building Museum at the Smithsonian. Because there were very few blueprints left because the scavengers in the building had used the blueprints to burn in barrels in the basements to keep warm. So, so it's just a very sad situation. So, but at least we were able to get the exhibit done. We've done some videos, you know, we've done some books, you know, to keep the legend going. So I think we, uh, we have to end it right now, don't we, Ann? That's about that time. The day that it was demolished was the day of my sister's wedding, October 24th, 1998. And the church that we were going to is at Beaconsfield and Maras. And um, so some people coming to her wedding had seen, you know, clouds and things. Um, so thank you very much. Well, thank you for coming today.